Welcome to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast with your host, Jim Robinson. Hello and welcome back to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Robinson. Today's episode, we're looking out, we're in mid-July. You may begin to notice some parchment-like lesions or damage in the leaves of corn on some of your corn on corn fields. This is a telltale sign of corn rootworm beetles and an indicator that we are approaching peak beetle emergence and may need to begin doing some scouting. To talk a little bit about that with us today, we have Rob Seco's agronomy manager, Wayne Fithian, joining us again. Welcome, Wayne. Uh, Good to be back, Jim. Excellent. So, Wayne, how does the timing of beetle emergence and especially peak beetle emergence look this year relative to the average? You know, uh, we're kind of on track with GDU accumulation across much of the area, so the crop's uh, kind of about where it should be. In fact, maybe even just a touch ahead because we had such a nice planting window this spring. So, uh, And and the, we projected a f- couple of months ago when we thought the beetle emergence would be, and, mm-hmm. and we were kind of right pretty close. There's a couple areas that the beetles are a little bit earlier than we expected them to be. But, you know, usually by the time you get into the 8th or 10th of July in the I-80 corridor, and certainly a week later, by the time we get up in the 90 corridor, uh, we should see beetles in the field. And you described it as parchment. uh, And that's a great way to put it. The leaves take on this parchment paper look. I always think of it as little windows. Yes. where, Where all you have left is the screen. Right. Mm-hmm. So what the beetles do is they're very picky feeders. They're a lot like kids in that way, right? They just they only like the soft epidermis on the leaf surface, on the mm-hmm. top and on the bottom. So they'll scrape away that epidermis and eat that. And what they'll leave is kind of the skeletal structure underneath. So it kind of looks like a window screen with the window wide open and the curtains pulled back. Right? Exactly. Long, exactly. narrow windows because they tend to work up and down the leaf. Mm-hmm. And tend to be on the lower part of the canopy, right? The lower, certainly below the ear zone. Because they're, uh, they're down there where it's cool and where they can hide and where it's nice and quiet. Exactly. Those beetles, they, they do prefer different parts of the plant, especially at different times of the year, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Wayne, what does beetle emergence look like this year? I mean, we had a pretty high populations last year. Yeah, we've been tracking, you know, with our with our uh, beetle trapping program, we've been tracking corn rootworm beetle populations over the last several years, and we've been seeing them grow. And so we had more beetles last year than we had the year before, and more beetles the year before than we did the year before that. So mm-hmm. back in 19, we didn't have near as many beetles as, and I think as we did in 20. And I think we're going to have a, a lot of beetles in the field this year. And unfortunately, that means we had quite a few corn rootworm because you can't have a beetle unless you had a corn rootworm, right? Kids, mm-hmm. I, that's kind of a one-to-one relationship. Actually, there's probably a few of those larvae that don't make it through the pupil stage. And so it's yeah. probably not quite a one-to-one, but if you got <laughs> beetles, you had rootworm. Absolutely. And yeah, we, we've seen, you know, really quite a favorable winter this last winter and spring for egg survival. Yep. And, and yeah, it was, you're right. It was nothing, nothing wrong with the kind of winter we had when we were cold. We had good snow cover. They were insulated. They were comfy down there. Mm-hmm. And of course, the overwinter in the egg stage, which is pretty resilient to start with. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have had some really cold winters that were, were very open with no snow cover where we have damaged the rootworm populations. Uh, but generally, they're they're pretty well protected down there. So, yeah, I think we're going to see uh, higher than normal beetle populations this year. And that means that we we need to be thinking about what that what's going to happen next year exactly. as a result of that. Exactly. So you mentioned this a little bit earlier that, that they create that kind of a, a window pane type of look on the leaves when they're scraping these leaves. Why is it the beetles, when they first emerge go straight to the leaves and especially the lower canopy. Why do they go there instead of what they do normally? Yeah, well, really, it's only the very first beetles that emerge and only in the fields that where they're the you know farthest along in terms of their development curve because beetles don't, like I said earlier, they're very picky eaters and they really don't like to eat leaves. Mm-hmm. They like to eat silks and they like to eat pollen. Mm-hmm. much more tender, much more juicy, much higher moisture content. So as soon as there are silks in a field, mm-hmm. as soon as there start to be pollen in the leaf axis, that's where they're going to move to. They're going to move to that ear zone. So while now in a pre-tassel field, they might be down low in the canopy. 
they're going to move up as soon as we start to see that ear emergence and those silks show up. Absolutely. And you know, it's worth noting that while they love to chew on those silks, those have to be really fresh silks for them to, to really want to feed on them. And so as we get later into the year and some of those silks start to become brown silks, you see beetles start to fly to different fields with later emerging silks. Yeah, they do that. And they also, they go down that ear tip and feed yes. down, in, down on that developing ear tip of that ear. But yeah, I think the, the movement to other fields, there's, there's two things we got to watch there. Number one, we can have receptor fields, fields that are planted to a really full season hybrid or that were planted late and they silk really late. We're mm-hmm. going to have beetles moving to those fields. And then I've also seen in several situations where we have two different relative maturity hybrids in the same field. And if that relative maturity difference is broad enough, five, seven, eight day difference in RM, so 111 day hybrid and 118 day hybrid, you will see those beetles move to that 118 day hybrid, Mm -hmm. which effectively doubles more or less the beetle population in that part of the field. Mm-hmm. I remember I remember a field uh, from my history once that uh, was only about uh, 10 acres of a 107-day hybrid in a field that was otherwise about 102-day. That hardly made any corn because the beetles just decimated every silk as they came <laughs> out because that 20 acres took all the beetles from 160 acres yep. <laughs> and concentrated them. So eight times the beetle population when it was trying to silk. And But the average corn hybrid in good conditions makes about 6,000 pollen grains per silk. So if you got 500 kernel initiations, that's 3 million pollen grains. So you got to have a lot of beetles out there to really stop pollination. If, mm-hmm. if you do, you're going to see scattered kernels. You're going to see uh, places on the year where you just had a miss. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So open spots on the cob where there are no kernels. And that's especially prevalent in those years where the beetles get really down and deep in there and with lots of beetles because they're all competing for the same silks. So that can definitely cause scattered or reduced pollination. Yeah, and I think the the thing about the beetle flight period is it's really important now to be out watching because now is the key to next year. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in a corn-soybean rotation in an area with extended diapause by the northern species, now is the key to two years from now Mm -hmm. what your rootworm population is going to be in that particular field either next year if you're corn on corn or two years from now with extended diapause corn on beans. So I, I think it's, it's critical to be out there looking and counting. And, and if you're counting beetles by hand, by manually, by eyes and hands, <laughs> you got to kind of sneak up on them. Mm-hmm. And you got to kind of, you know, walk into the field and then stop, let everything settle back down, kind of peek a row across and see what's going on over there, how many beetles are flying. A lot of people don't like to do that. It's a little bit tedious, a little bit time yeah. consuming. You got to find all of them that are down in the leaf axis. So technology now has allowed us these yellow traps. Mm-hmm. They're sticky. And when a beetle flies into one of them, it can't get away. Exactly. And if you just put them in the area of the ear zone or you put them above the soy, if you're, if you're in a Western variant area where you could have egg laying in a soybean field, you just put them a couple of feet above the canopy of the soybean field, they fly into the soybean field, they hit the, and then you can just count the number of beetles you have on the trap. Exactly. And you know what kind of a pressure you're going to have in your corn crop or your either next year or two years from now. Yeah. So if, if you have a sticky trap out, what should you be looking for as the number of beetles caught on that trap per day before you actually start to worry about, I need to do something for next year to manage these beetles? Yeah, I think uh, the the key is that you want to have the trap out there for three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. So, and you want to replace it each week, and and then you you divide the total number of beetles on the trap by seven because we keep track of beetles per trap per day. Yep. Right. So, if you had uh, twenty one beetles on your trap at the end of the seventh day, that's three beetles per trap per day, right? Twenty one mm-hmm. divided by seven that makes three. That's too many beetles. If you got 21 beetles on your trap, you're going to have corn rootworm problems next year. So what I want to see is down in that 14 or less for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if it's extended diapause and it's northern species that I'm seeing on the beetle trap, then you can cut it in half because what the research has shown that only about half of the northerns make it through to the second year. Right. So in that case, 21 northerns in an extended diapause area, I wouldn't get too worked up. Mm-hmm. I got to see 40 or 50 on yep. that trap or be in that up in that neighborhood of four or five per day. Exactly. Exactly. Now, 
you know, two plus beetles per day doesn't sound like a whole lot, but how many eggs can a gravid, so pregnant female lay? Well, you're the one who looked that up. You really ought to tell us. <laughs> yeah, so a single gravid female can, those are the fat females, you kind of squeeze them a little bit and eggs come out the back end. Uh, they can lay up to 200 eggs in her lifetime. Yeah. That's a lot of beetles and that's a lot of rootworm. Yeah, so you think about, you know, if you have, uh, if you have uh, that 20... One beetles per trap per day, you know, that's uh, to see tw- uh, three times to 600 <laughs> <laughs> eggs per day, you mm-hmm. might say, at the time they start laying. And the really nice thing about uh, the, the beetles when you're out there counting them or you're monitoring what's on your trap is that you can tell when they're pregnant. Mm hmm. And, uh, and, and when they're getting, when it, when a, you know, you're starting to see a good number of them get pretty pregnant and they look like, you know, instead of these nice little sleek beetles, they're these really heavy weighted down, big fat abdomens and they have a hard time just like, yeah, <laughs> when you're pregnant, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's when you time, if you're going to do an adult control program, and there are plenty of people who still use adult control to manage their corn rootworm population for the next year, right, by eliminating the beetles, because if you eliminate the beetles, you don't have larvae, right? Exactly. But if you eliminate the beetles after they lay their eggs, well, you still have larvae, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to eliminate the beetles before they lay eggs, so you want to be watching for when you start to see those gravid females, and that's when you time your application for And, of course, you want to use a, 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 a insecticide that's labeled for corn rootworm adult beetle control, and, mm-hmm. and you want something that's got some longevity because, remember, earlier we were talking about the fact that they fly. Yes. And so you could have... Beetles come in from another field, and and that's why even if I did the beetle spray, I'd probably go back in a week later. Now, I say a week later because that's a usual reentry period after an application, right? Right. Put up another trap. Mm -hmm. See whether or not you get more beetles. See whether or not, you know, you still had some coming out of your own uh, field or whether you got beetles coming in from another field. So I think it's really important not only to monitor on the front end, but monitor you know, after an application, if you do adult beetle control. And, and yep. you know, we've got lots of customers using adult control that are having a lot of success. Exactly. Uh, limiting the number of eggs that are laid and therefore the number of corn rootworm larvae they have out in that field for to become a corn rootworm problem next year in a corn-on-corn situation. Absolutely. You know, Wayne, it's not always possible to control the adult beetle population. While it may be one of the most effective methods, what are my options next year if I can't get it done this year or if I realize I'm too late, all the females have laid their eggs? You know, I think if, if you if you got a lot of beetles in the field mm-hmm. and you don't do something about controlling them, then your best option is to rotate next year and mm-hmm. not give them corn to eat. Right. Yes. Yeah, because they can't survive on soybeans and they can't survive on wheat and they can't survive on grain sorghum. So you give them something else to eat and they perish. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. I like dead corn rootworm larvae. Yes, it is. Uh, the other options would be, uh, of course, we can, we can use traits. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can use insecticides mm-hmm. at planting yep. or we can use the combination of the two. Yeah, and and uh, I think the the key is if you have a lot of beetles laying eggs and you didn't do anything about control, then you probably can't rely on one or the other. Exactly. In, in those situations where you've got a lot of pressure, our our best success is is having two effective modes of action out in that field. That being a trait and an insecticide. And and my personal bias is that granulars work better than liquids. Mm-hmm. They're just they just stay in the soil and they're active for a longer time period. And if we're planting the end of April and the rootworm aren't hatching until the end of May, maybe the first of June, I want that long I want that residual. Exactly. I want to have that material still out there yep. doing some work for me. Oftentimes that those liquids will be gone within the soil and, and un- unable to be effective within just a few days to a few weeks of, of application. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're right. They're very effective for wireworms and for cutworms mm-hmm. and for seed corn maggots. And But, you know, we got, we've got other materials on the seed already that really help with wireworm and seed corn maggots, and we got Viptera for those cutworms. So mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, let's if we're going to go after rootworm, let's, let's make sure we got something out there that's going to have the longevity to be there when the rootworm hatch. Exactly. 
you know, to add one thing to your comment about rotation being the best method of control, you know, oftentimes one of the get biggest pushbacks we get when we recommend rotation as being the, the best method of control is that I just don't make as much money off of a rotated crop as I do off of corn. But you know, to be honest, a lot of times we forget to include the two-year benefits of a rotation versus doing corn on corn year in and year out. You have lower seed costs, not just in that rotational crop typically, but also in the year following that you don't have to pay for additional corn rootworm traits. You don't have to pay for additional fertility. You don't have a yield penalty where we may experience that in some geographies with corn on corn versus corn on beans, let's say. And so oftentimes you're looking at a two-year budget of cost savings and improved revenues may actually be a, a, a reasonable option. Well, I think those are really good points, Jim. And, and the only thing I would add to that is that if, if I have a corn crop out there, and I got a bunch of corn rootworm eating it. I got I got a lot of problems. I, mm-hmm. I'm not going to have the crop I wanted to have. So, so some cases uh, the rotation allows you to go ahead and experience a full yield potential of a corn crop that follows, as opposed to limping in with a rootworm damaged corn crop. Exactly, exactly. So, Wayne, to kind of summarize everything we've talked about today, we are here in the middle of July, getting into the peak of the corn rootworm beetle emergence. And so we're going to see if we haven't already started seeing lots and lots of beetles coming out there. So right now is the best time to get a sticky trap or to go out into your fields and walk into the field, pause for a minute, duck down, peek a row or two over, take a look at how many beetles you have around and consider if you catch on your beetle trap two or more beetles per day, it's time to start thinking about some control measures. Now, that may be a control measure this season, where when you start to see gravid females, so the fat, plump females that are able to lay eggs, make sure you follow and read all labels. But use an insecticide applied fully early, especially something with a little bit of of perduring activity. Otherwise, you can consider rotation as your best method of control for next year. If rotation is not an option or, or something to that degree, you can look at using some trait control. So that would be products like Duracade. You can also look at insecticide at planting and granulars do typically work better than liquids themselves. And a combination of traits and insecticide is often even better than any either one of those alone. So anything you'd like to add? Well, and again, I just reinforce that uh, rootworm beetles are a lot like kids. They're picky eaters. Mm -hmm. So they only like the epidermis, and once the silks are out and the pollen's there, they move to that. And uh, the other thing is, is, you know, if if you don't monitor and work with your kid, sometimes you're disappointed later. And Mm -hmm. if you don't monitor and watch these rootworm, you're probably going to be disappointed later. That's a very good anecdote. Yes. (laughs) I'm going to have to talk to my kids. No. (laughs) So... As always, be sure to tune in on the 1st and 15th of every month for new episodes. And until then, stay field ready. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. Join us next time to be field ready. A Huda Media Production.